you got your Bibles, John 4. John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at a very familiar story this morning as we continue our series called God Is. And so it's a long passage. I'm going to read just some portions of it for the first couple verses, and then we'll, I'll just basically share the story with you this morning. So but read with me John 4, chapter, verse 1. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, even though Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples were, he left Judea and he went to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. And so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well and it was about noon. A woman of Samaria came in to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, she said, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will never will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her. And then come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You've correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands. And the man that you have now is not even your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman said, I see that you're a prophet. Our worshipers worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said, believe me, woman. An hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything. And Jesus said to her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And so we're in week three of this series called God Is. And we're looking, basically what we're doing in this series is we're looking at our confessional theology of what we say we believe what we sing, what we proclaim, and how our functional, how our confessional theology is often contrary to our functional theology, how we live, how we behave, how we respond, and how oftentimes these two things don't align together. You probably heard this statement before, if you, um, you've probably heard this statement before that that you, to balance between work and home, the statement that, hey, leave your work at work. So maybe you've had the experience where you're driving home from work and you've had a long day and your mind is racing, right? You've got emails to respond to. You have meetings that are coming up, concerns that you have, people that need to be cared for, emails that need to be written. And you re- drive into your driveway, you get into your garage and you realize that if you bring work home, It'll take away from the people in your family. And so you've heard, leave your work at work because there's people at home that need your time and your presence and your attention during that time. And that's a good statement. A thing that is less helpful is the idea that you are to leave your theology at church. And that's kind of what we're looking at in this series. That... And sadly, that's what a lot of us do. Because we're great at singing and believing that 
God, you're great. God, you are powerful. God, you're marvelous. God, you are wonderful and you're strong and you're able to deliver. But we struggle when we leave the four walls of this building to trust that he's in control. And so we live angry. We live upset. We live frustrated because things don't go the way that we want it to go. We sing songs about the glory of God and how glorious it is and remind ourselves how he's loved us and he's approved us and he's accepted us. And then we walk out of these doors and we live lives looking to live for the approval of others around us. We will with smiles on our faces sing that he's a good, good father. But then we'll look to everything around us for satisfaction and joy and contentment instead of finding joy and satisfaction and contentment in Jesus. We'll bask in the truth that God is gracious, and in his grace he saved us, not because of ourselves, but because of Jesus. But then we'll live our lives trying to prove ourselves to people, and prove ourselves to ourselves, and prove ourselves to God, saying, God, you've got to accept me. Look how good I am. I hope that you've seen that these four struggles that we've been talking about, they're not standalone struggles. But all four of these are connected the first two that we've looked at, that God is great so we don't have to be in control. And God is great, glorious so we don't have to um, fear others are actually ways and means that trying to grab onto this third one that we're looking at this morning. So we're desperate for control. We're desperate to get good opinions and approvals of people. And so we use them and we manipulate them because we're in this search for joy and satisfaction in our lives. Because we're constantly in search for something that can be our identity. We're constantly longing to be satisfied. And you know, this isn't a new longing. But it's something that's been imprinted on us by God. The desire for joy. The desire for satisfaction. The desire for contentment. The desire for fulfillment is given to us by our creator. And so this morning, we're going to look at this third statement, God is good, so we don't have to look elsewhere. Let me start by thinking about fulfillment with you. When you think about fulfillment in life, when, what does fulfillment in life look like for you? How do you fill in the blanks for this sentence? If only blank if only this would happen, or if only I could have this, or if only this changed, or if only this defined my life, then everything would be great. If only blank, then I will be happy and satisfied. How do you fill in that blank? Maybe it's a promotion. Maybe it's a specific car or a house that you want. Maybe it's the perfect spouse. Maybe it's great kids. Maybe it's financial security. Maybe it's more friends. Maybe it's less friends. Maybe it could be something, man, if I could just get my health in order and health better, things would be great. Maybe it's becoming the best in your field. Maybe it's becoming recognized and getting awards for the work that you do. Maybe it's graduating at the top of your class and getting offered multiple jobs. Maybe it's just getting married. That will fulfill all my hopes and dreams, which is true. You should do that and find out that it absolutely does. Hey, babe. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's a desire within you, a desire for peace, or a desire for excitement, or a desire for adventure, a desire for purpose. Whatever it is that's driving you to say that if I could just get this, then life would be good. We all have that, right? We all have something in our lives that we say, man, I just wish I had this. But notice you probably didn't create those desires. You probably don't ever remember waking up and saying, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to start desiring this. It's just something that's built in. You just notice it, you discover it, and you pursue it. And 
also right now, you're either discovering your desires, you're living in your desires, you're ignoring your desires, or you're pushing your desires to the side. Those are the choices that you make with those desires. So the question is, what are we going to do with these desires that are within us? I want you to see that these desires that we have is actually given to us by God. See, a lot of times in the Christian world, desires are given a bad rap because desires will lead you astray. Or you can't trust your desires. And becoming a mature Christian means that you kill your desires. You ever heard those statements? You ever heard things like that? And now, listen, there's some truth to that. Desires are as implicated by the fall as everything else. And yes, your desires, just like your intellect and just like your body, have been affected by sin. So that's partly true. But what I want, don't want you to do is dismiss or kill your desires because those desires built in by God are ultimately meant to push you toward God or to draw you to Jesus. And so if you want to live the life that God has designed for you to live, these desires are really important for you to be able to live into the life that God calls us to in scriptures. Calvin, I'm so glad you're here. Um, back in December, Calvin, who I work out with, and he's trying to get me uh, back in shape, tried to encourage me to go on to this plant-based diet, right? And at that moment, I wasn't spiritually strong enough to say, get thee behind me, Satan. And so... <laughs> So I did it for a few weeks. Now listen, this would have been incredibly easy if my wife and my kids joined me in this quest for a healthy lifestyle. But no, what made it really difficult during those weeks was while I was basically eating leaves from outside, they were eating steak and chicken and fish and burgers. And so here I am eating leaves and grass while all the while desiring. And desiring is probably too short of a fur, too understatement, but desiring everything that was on their plate. See, what if I approached it like, you know what? I can't stop this desire for steak. I love steak. It's delicious. It's good. If I could have steak, I would eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But I know that eating steak isn't good for me all the time. And eating leaves is going to make me a grumpy old man that no one will want to be around. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to get rid of my desire to eat at all. That wouldn't make sense. That way I'm not going to desire steak and I don't have to eat leaves anymore, right? That would be a tragic mistake. Because the desire doesn't need to be killed. The desire just needs to be redirected. It needs to be redirected to a lifestyle that's healthy and balanced. And so steak five times a day. Um, Five times a week is what I meant, but five times a day works as well, so. Uh, God is good. I'm hungry. God is good. So you don't have to look elsewhere. We need to know that those desires, so that we could put them in the right place. Again, these longings and desires are imprinted on us by God. The desire for joy, the desire for satisfaction is actually given to us by our creator. Many think that if you want to have a relationship with God through Jesus, then it's about giving everything up. It's about resisting the urge to be satisfied. The reality is just the opposite. The reality is about being satisfied eternally in God where you can then look at everything else through a proper lens and proper perspective. The Christian walk is not about denying joy, but by over, being overwhelmed by the joy and saying, I'm not going to make these things my ultimate, but because I have found joy and satisfaction in Jesus, these things fall into their proper place. God is not opposed to our want or our desire for joy and satisfaction. Friends, he put it there. And yet, the problem is we're so good at settling for lesser joys. We settle for temporary things that we believe will satisfy us. We settle for temporary emotions. And in the end, we end up chasing after illusions or mirages that just disappear as soon as we get close. Whatever promises joy and satisfaction is nothing but a mirage and an oasis in the desert. 
It's just this thing that may temporarily satisfy, but then disappears just as quickly as it appeared, whether it's money or sex or work or family or material things. We may be satisfied for a whole minute, but then realize that it doesn't really satisfy us. We may find happiness for a second in those things, but then quickly realize, this is not enough, I need more. And quickly, we look for more. And so we continue to search. The problem for us is not the desire that's in us. It's not the desire for satisfaction. It's not the desire for joy. It's that we're settling when we can chase that desire. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, it seems, you back there? Got a quote for you guys somewhere. C.S. Lewis says it this way. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires are not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what it's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. I love how C.S. Lewis starts that quote. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. The desire for joy, the desire for satisfaction that we have because of sin, it's actually too weak on what we settle with because we settle for lesser temporary things instead of God. And in this chasing after mud pies, we're seeking control. We seek to manipulate people, the fear of man, in order to find joy and satisfaction in life. See, it's a desire that's common to each and every one of us, and we know this because this is why marketing exists. Commercials tell you that if you buy these clothes, you'll be happy. If you have this car, you've reached it. If you do this with your retirement, you'll find satisfaction when you retire. We'll look at others and often see what they have. We'll see what they post on social media and they appear to be happy and joyful. They appear to be taking vacations all over the world. They seem to be having the latest phones and the technologies. In reality, we're only seeing one side of the story because you have no idea if they put that entire vacation on a credit card and is paying it off for the next 40 years. But we see the side of the story that we want to see. We see that they appear to be happy. They appear to be joyful. They appear to be loving life. And so we look at their lifestyle and we look at their homes and we look at their family and we look at whatever else that they have and we wish that, man, I wish I had that for myself. What scripture calls coveting, desiring what you don't have. They seem to have found joy. They seem to have found happiness. They seem to have found satisfaction. I want that. And so we covet it. We all do this. All of us do. And this is why marketing is so successful. The ads, the commercials are all because there's this satisfaction and joy that, to point us to say, you need to have this to have true joy and meaning. The problem is we've turned the search inward. We're told, think about who you are. Think about what you're satisfied in. Think about social media. You're constantly on there liking things. You're constantly writing reviews and giving ratings to restaurants and experiences based on if you're happy with their service, if the food was good, if you're satisfied with the service that they provide you. After you watch the movie, you're asking those who you went with, what'd you think? Did you like it? Was it a good movie? After a sermon, you're like, man, that sermon was so good, or that sermon was horrible, or as Pastor Sam went again too long, and I'm starving again because he talked about steak in the beginning, and so, and you're... Judging, you guys don't do that, right? We're constantly gauging how joyful and satisfied we are by an experience or an event. And we've been conditioned that way. We're constantly consumed by evaluating everything and consumed by our own thoughts. What did it do for me? We're constantly going, what do I think about this? What does this mean to me? Do I give this three stars? Do I give this five stars? Do I give this one star? Do I give it three and a half stars? And so we're constantly gauging everything around us by saying, what did it do for me? And the reality is we constantly think, as we constantly turn that inward, we begin to go, well, you know, this was good, but I could definitely get better, right? This car that I have right now is really nice. It gets me to work, but 
man, it would be really nice to get some heated seats in here. It'd be really nice to have that car that just automatically parks for you. Um, this phone I have right now, but man, dang, the Samsung S11 is coming out, and that's so much better than that paperweight by, that's called after a fruit, right? Um, um, this phone, my phone right now works great. It's so fun to be up here today. Um, it actually does what it's supposed to. It makes calls, but there's a new one coming out. And this one isn't really bringing me joy all of a sudden because, man, that new one looks so much better. And so we're constantly inwardly thinking, this is what joy means. This is where I can find joy. And we end up wanting all the time, and we're never satisfied. And this isn't just a modern-day era, a modern-day problem. It's magnified more and more in our times because of things like social media. But we're constantly sharing, where we're constantly sharing how we feel, but it's the same in every age. 2,000 years ago wasn't any different. And we're going to see in this encounter that Jesus has with this Samaritan woman that even her longings and desires were there. A few things from the context of this passage to understand the magnitude of God's grace and the magnitude of God's love and really understand what we're looking at this morning, the goodness of God taught to us in this passage. If you have your Bibles, verse 4 says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. At this first, it seems like there's almost no other way for Jesus to get to this destination, and so this is where he has to go through. But that's not true. The Jewish people did everything possible to avoid Samaria. They would, if they had to go to a city past Samaria, they would go around the city, even if it meant a long journey just to get where they needed to go. The Jews and Samaritans are very much like the Jews and the Palestinians today. They hated each other. The actual translation, though, is that Jesus was compelled to go through Samaria. He was urged by the sovereign grace of God to go through Samaria because he knew there was a mission there for him to do. Samaritans and Jews don't get along. Samaritans are half-breeds. They had intermarried with people who were not followers of Jesus. And going into Samaria for a Jew was considered unclean, especially if you were a rabbi, which Jesus was considered were a Jewish leader. So Jesus is going through Samaria, and the woman that he begins to have conversation with, Jesus going through Samaria is already scandalous. And then he begins to have this woman, a conversation with this woman, which becomes even more scandalous. Jesus is compelled to go to this place where this woman lived. And then he gets to the city. He goes to the city well. The well was a place where women would go early in the morning before it got too hot, and they would get water for the day, fresh water, drinking water, cleaning water. And Jesus shows up at noon. This is way after the time the woman would have come and gone. And he's sitting there, and all of a sudden, this one young lady shows up. And so she's walking to get her water, and Jesus surprises her and says, hey, could you give me a drink of water? She's astounded that he would even notice her. And she's like, dude, you're a Jew. You're not supposed to be talking to me. We're enemies. We don't get along. You're not supposed to be asking me questions. You're not supposed to be starting a conversation, and you're not supposed to be asking me to serve you. We don't talk. Your group, my group, nah, -uh. we're separate groups. And Jesus doesn't even respond to her statement. He doesn't respond to the Samaria Jewish division. He doesn't talk about um, the division that's going on. Instead, he says, hey, if you really knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water. If you knew who I was, you would be asking a question that was completely different. And she's confused. We probably would be as well. She just sees what's right in front of her. Someone that shouldn't be talking to her. Someone that she grew up despising. Someone she grew up being told that these people don't like you. These people will not talk to you. These people will not be nice to you. These people will actually turn their backs on you. And here's this guy talking to her. And he's now talking to her about water. She's like, um, you don't even have a bucket. You don't have a rope. And you're going to offer me living water? And she's looking at what's right in front of her. She even asked, you know, are you greater than our father Jacob? Who, who are you? Why did you come here? Why are you in our city right now? She's looking at the practical. She's looking at the immediate. She looks at what she knows and what's right in front of her. And Jesus goes into detail a bit now about what he's talking about. What he's saying is, 
man, you're finding temporary satisfaction in the water in this well. But you've got to come back. Tomorrow afternoon, you're going to come back again. You're going to keep coming back for the rest of your life to get water because you're always thirsty. You do that because this water will never satisfy you. It'll satisfy you momentarily, but tomorrow you're going to have to come back to get more. What I'm offering you is something that will last eternally. And she's still thinking, what's in front of her? She's like, all right, this sounds good. I want to drink. I need water. And I don't want to come here in the middle of the day. And so I wish I want that. I, I desire that. Jesus, give me some of that water. This sounds awesome. Awesome. I'm in. Show me the contract. Where do I sign? How much do I pay? Give me this water. You have me, Mr. Marketing Guy. And then Jesus all of a sudden takes a right-hand turn. All of a sudden he's talking about water, and then he's in the middle of the conversation. He's like, go home, get your husband, and come back. And Jesus is ADD or something, right? Right in the middle of a sentence, he's like, we're talking about water. Go get your husband. And changes the direction of the whole conversation now. And she just quickly responds, I don't have a husband. And she leaves it at that. And all of a sudden, we see that this turn that seemed out of the blue, that turn that seemed just confusing, this question about the husband, is Jesus actually going at the heart of the conversation about what thirst really is. And Jesus says, listen, I know your story. I know who you are. Yeah, you're right. You're not lying to me. You don't have a husband right now. But you've actually had five. And the guy that you're living with right now is not even someone you're married to. So yeah, technically you're right. You don't have a husband. Jesus is going right at the heart. See, this was never about water for Jesus. Jesus is starting to pick away at the layers of this woman's heart. He's starting to show what he's really talking about, what thirst really is. Because you can imagine this woman's story. Five husbands. No one enters into marriage number one saying, all right, here's one. I've got four more coming. (laughs) She entered into marriage like we all do. This is for life. This is awesome. We're a match made in heaven. We're perfect for each other. We have this cool hashtag that we use for our ceremony. We're perfect. I love him. She loves me. We're going to live happily ever after. You know what? There's a lot of if onlys. Because this is where, because this is what reveals where our thirst is. Five times. If only this was the one. Then I'll be satisfied. And after maybe the third time, you're like, man, if only he would stay. We don't know what happened to these five. Maybe some of them died in the process. Maybe they all died. And I don't know what, the sixth one is like, I'm not making a commitment to you. I'll probably end up dead too, right? But there's all of these if onlys. If only this one would work. If only I can find love with him. If only we could live happily ever after. Five times this happens. And now... With this guy, she's like, if only this guy just doesn't leave. I don't care if I'm married to him or not. If only he would take care of me. If only he would provide for me. I mean, understand that marriage back then is completely different from marriage today. It wasn't like she could go out and be single, a vibrant woman on her own, and get a job and take care of herself. She needed someone in her life. She needed someone for a source of survival. But there was this, if only this one, that was the theme of this woman's life. And so Jesus begins to push into her. He begins to press into her. And he says, listen, you're well. This place that you're coming for to find satisfaction, this longing that you have is relationships in your life. It is the well that you keep coming back to. In our search for joy and satisfaction, friends, we are no different from this woman. Our well may be different, but... At the heart of it, we're no different, if only. What's your if only? If only I had a bigger house. If only I had a better job. If only I had a better boss. If only my kids behaved. If only I could stop sinning. Then I would be satisfied. Then I would find joy. And Jesus, through this conversation, is revealing to this woman her, if only, the place that she constantly goes to to be satisfied, the place that she constantly goes to to find joy. And friends, it was sinful. 
She's now living with a man that she's not married to. There's no denying that. There's no escaping that. And Jesus is not avoiding it. But that's what sin is. Sin in our lives, whatever it is, is a declaration that we are searching for joy and satisfaction and that we do not believe that God is good enough. And so we break his promises and we break his commands and say, I've got to find joy and satisfaction somewhere else. Whether that's when we're greedy with our money, whether it's when we're lustful after another person, whether it's when we're being lazy and not doing what we're supposed to do, whether we're, we're worshiping and finding our identity and our children and our lives revolve around them and their happiness, that they become the center of our lives. Whatever it is, sin is when we are declaring that, God, you are not good and you are not enough, and so I'm going to elevate something else higher. This is what I'm going to be satisfied in. This is where I'm going to find joy in. This is what I'm going to pursue. And it goes way back beyond the 2,000 years ago with this woman. This has been the struggle of humanity since the fall. Remember, this was the nature of the fall. The fall was, hey, God's not really good. God is not enough. You need to go and eat from this tree because once you eat from this tree, then you'll have everything you want. God's not good. God's not enough. And ever since then, since our first parents sinned, you and I have been in this search for longing and joy and satisfaction. Sin is our misplaced search for joy and satisfaction. And Jesus confronts this woman with that. And it wasn't a shock to her. She wasn't shocked that Jesus knew her story. She just doesn't want to talk about it. She wants to move on. You ever notice that when someone confronts you about something, you're like, you know what, let's just move on. Let's talk about how crappy the cowboys are, right? Um, she quickly moves on to another conversation. And here's the crazy thing. Jesus doesn't harp on it. I mean, this woman goes immediately to theology. She takes a right-hand turn on her own. Jesus is talking about marriage, and she's like, oh, you must be a prophet. All right, let's talk about theology for a second. And she gets into this deep theological debate. You know what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't go, oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about your sin issue right now. He doesn't do that. He says, let's talk about your relationship issues. Let's talk about the sin. I want to dwell on this sin right now. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. She knows. She knows. Her heart has been pricked. It almost seems at first Jesus is trying not to be judgmental and bringing this up again and that he doesn't want to hurt her feelings that he's just going to drop the issue. But her right-hand turn about worship, about where to worship, about which group is right, do you worship here on this mountain like the Samaritans do, or do we have to make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem and worship there? Jesus, which is it? Which is it, Mr. Prophet? She's trying to change the subject, but Jesus like, you know what? You're actually going to where the heart of the issue is. You're going right where I want you to go. And Jesus isn't necessarily stoning zoning in on making sure that she, what she's doing is wrong and sinful. What he's doing is he's getting behind to the heart of it. Why are you doing that? The longing behind that. See, sometimes you and I can get so caught up in sin or someone else's sin that we're just like, you just need to stop doing that. And you just need to quit. But instead of loving them and talking to them about their heart, See, the issue isn't that she's been married five times and is now living with a man that she's not married to. The issue is why. Why is she in her sixth relationship? Why is she search what is she searching for in this process with these relationships? You know, if Jesus said, hey, slow down, slow down, let's talk about these relationships, she could have easily said, you know what, you're right. Oh my gosh, you're right. She could have went home, moved out from her boyfriend, and she never would have talked about why she keeps going back over and over to find joy and satisfaction in these other men. But Jesus says, why do you do this? Why do you keep going there? What is the heart? What is the true answer? It'd be like cutting off the top of a weed in my grass and never getting to the root. For a while, my grass will look good, but a few months later, I look out, all the weeds are still there. Did the lime tree sprout back up? And Jesus is going to the heart behind the sin, the longing for what's behind these acts. And so he doesn't press into her about her sin. He just answers the question. 
He tells her, hey, your people's history is about not knowing that salvation has come from my people. Jesus comes from the Jewish people. Salvation has come to them. It's no longer about a people group. It's no longer about a location. But worship is to be done wherever one is. And Jesus hones in on worship. See, Jesus says worship is to be done no matter where you are. But true worship is when it's done in spirit and in truth. In other words, worship that's done by faith and guided by truth. Worship is not about a location, Jesus says. It's about an attitude of your heart. You worship in spirit and in truth. You worship what you desire most, what you think about, and what you give most worth to. In other words, worshiping, knowing God comes from enjoying God for who he is and finding our fulfillment in God and God alone. It is finding God that he has the most worth and enjoying our relationship with God. You see that Jesus isn't just going on topic to topic and answering questions here, saying, hey, we've come to this. Now you know who I am. If you know this, you would never thirst. And she says, all right, I see water. Give me this water. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, go call your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. You have a lot of relationships. And he starts to reveal to her, hey, this is your well. This is where you're trying to find your identity. This is where you're trying to find your worth. This is where you're trying to find who you are. This is where you're trying to find joy and satisfaction. Oh, you know a lot, Mr. Jesus. What about worship? Tell me about worship. No, no, no. Worship isn't about a location. Worship is about spirit and shoot. It doesn't matter where you are. It's going to be what you are most satisfied in. That's what you're going to worship. It's only when you are most encapsulated by God, who you truly worship. It's only then you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. It's what you follow with all of you. And Jesus says, if you knew that question, you weren't asked. If you knew who I was, you weren't asked that question. See, worship isn't a dull, boring task. See, sometimes when we talk and say that God is good, we don't have to look elsewhere. Sometimes you'll hear like, you just need to worship him. And I'm like, I don't want to sing another Chris Tomlin song. I don't want to go to heaven and sing the same song for 10 million years. That sounds really boring to me. But that's not worship. Worship is the actual enjoyment, the satisfaction, the joy of knowing and being loved by God. Do you realize that you are worshiping right now? Now, I know Christian lingo that we go to worship, and I use that lingo all the time. But worship is more than just the four, five, six, seven songs that these guys sing every Sunday morning. Do you realize that listening to God's word being preached, diving deeper into God's word, seeing his grace and love in your life as you sit here, that's worship. And do you realize that as you live a thankful life, enjoying your relationship with God and being God's ambassadors for the gospel in your workplace, in your school, as you work to the best of your ability, as you are called to be good stewards of your finances, as you're called to be good workers and love and care for those around you, that in that when you are doing that, you are actually worshiping. You're worshiping. What about your family? You realize that when you are raising your children, when you talk to them about Jesus, when you love them, when you thank God for them, when you enjoy them as gifts that God has made you stewards over, not as gods themselves whose lives you revolve around, of, around but as gifts from God when you enjoy them and you point them to Jesus, you are in that moment you are worshiping. The Samaritan woman thought, Hey, if I could go to this mountain, is that the best place to worship? Will God hear me up on this mountain, or do I really need to go to the temple? And Jesus goes, no, no, no. Worship isn't about being at a location. It's about you being consumed. It's about finding joy and satisfaction in God wherever you are. How was your worship this week? How was your worship this week? You know, being a Christian, all these years, I would talk about worship as, uh, I don't know if some of you have been a Christian long enough, we have these conference highs, right? Um, not sure if you could relate. Some of you might know what the conference high is. Others of you, you've been a, you might not have been a Christian long enough, and you have no idea what a conference high is. And so God bless your soul. That's awesome. But here's the conference high. 
You go to a conference. The music is awesome. The people are awesome. The sermons are awesome. And there's like 5,000 people around you, and they're all worshiping Jesus. When I was younger, we'd go to these annual conferences that our denomination would be a part of. But when I got to college, it was the Passion Conference. And so I was at that first Passion Conference in Tennessee and back in 2000, I think. And so I would go, and my best friend and I drove to Tennessee from, um, from Tulsa, where we were living. And we worshiped with thousands and thousands of other college students. And it was awesome. And we get back, and we're on this adrenaline and high. And we're like, man, that was great. That was worship. That was powerful. And then we were excited for a while. And then a few months go by, and the excitement is gone. And we're like, man, when's the next conference? When's the next experience? When's passion happening again? Why is it only every other year? Now, thank God, it's every year. Um, that was real worship. That was a real experience. That was a really powerful moment. But friends... That was wrong theology because I was making worship about a place and a group of people that was leading instead of saying, my life is worship before God. Real worship, friends, is in the mundane. Real worship happens in the day-to-day -day of life. Sometimes we make this mistake and think that worship is this gathering that we do on Sunday morning, worship time, conference time, worship time. When I have my Bible before me, that, that's worship time. But friends, worship is through spirit and truth wherever you are. It's not about a place. It's about being consumed by the goodness of God, his greatness, the joy that we are made to know him and love him, that we have been saved by him, that he has forgiven us through the God and we are overwhelmed by that and our lives are different friends that is worship that's worship that our creator cares about us that he loves us that he knows me by name that he knows what I need today and he says my God shall supply my needs according to his riches and glory that it digs deep into this joy that even in the mundane things of my life my life is bringing glory to God you worship God in the small task as much as you worship when you sing here on Sunday morning, do you realize that? Actually, let me rephrase that. You should worship God in the small tasks of life. When you're doing your homework, it's worship. When you're working, it's worship. In fact, Scripture says whatever you do, whether it's eating or drinking, do it for the glory of God. Do it as worship. And because of our sin, we usually get caught up in something bigger than ourselves long enough to simply fill us for a moment, and then we get so back to being consumed by ourselves. Think about the last problem or challenge that you face in life. Think about the last difficulty you've experienced. How did you worship God through that? How did you exalt God in the midst of that? Or were you so concerned about your joy and your satisfaction and your happiness in that moment that you totally took God out of the equation? Well, you don't understand, Sam. That was a big issue. That was a life-changing decision for me. When were you not caught up with who God is? And that's what Jesus is saying here. And she goes, okay, wow, spirit, truth, got it, Messiah. And when he gets here, he's going to tell us all this stuff. And Jesus just blunts out, uh, Messiah, um, hold on a second. That's me. You're looking at him. And friends, that joy changes everything. She's transformed. She's seen God's goodness. The one that they were waiting for, the one that the Jews had talked about, that the one that history has been waiting for, the anointed one of God, God's king has come to reconcile, to bring grace and love. That one is standing before her. Before her. This woman that has to go to the well at noon because she's that woman. The one that comes at noon because she wants to avoid the other women that come in the morning because she's looked down on by the people in their city. Why do you think she comes at noon? All the other women are gone now. 
Why did she come at noon? Because she doesn't want to put up with their whispers. Oh, you know about her, right? She also doesn't want to put up with their prayer requests. Hey, sister, would you pray for her? Let me tell you about her. It's the shame that she feels about all this. And she goes to the well at noon in the middle of the heat. And all of a sudden, this guy, this Jew, this rabbi, who she was taught to hate, with, she thinks is now looking down on her. But he starts talking to her. And then all of a sudden, he brings up her relationship status. But he doesn't harp on it. He just moves on talking to her about satisfaction, her joy in God. And then all of a sudden he says, I am the Messiah. This woman who was lonelier than low in the eyes of the Jews, defiled, multiple marriages, living with this guy. She's a Samaritan. Think about a people group right now that you would think church people would be offended by, wouldn't want to be around by. You know what's amazing? Jesus reveals himself to her. He doesn't reveal himself to anyone else. He doesn't go to the religious leaders and say, I'm the Messiah. There'd be some people who would be like, oh, you're the Messiah. And Jesus would be like, be quiet. But then he goes flat out and tells this woman, hey, I'm what you're looking for. I'm what you need. I'm the Messiah. And everything changes for this woman. There is this joy in her life, a satisfaction in her life. How do I know? Look at her reaction. We didn't read it, but the woman leaves her jar and goes into town, and she says to the town people, she says, come see this guy who has told me everything about me. Can this be the Christ? 20 minutes earlier, she was avoiding people. Because of her life and her past, she doesn't want to be around anyone. But now she's running into town and she's screaming, come, come, see this guy. He knows my history. She's talking about her history all of a sudden. He knows what I've done. He knows my past. He knows my failures. He's talking to me. Can this be the one? She runs and tells everyone. She doesn't care about herself at that moment. She doesn't care about her reputation at that moment because she's caught up in this greater love, in this greater grace. She's caught up in God. She's caught up in who God is, his grace and his love. And friends, that changes everything. She's not consumed with her own life. And she's not walking saying, oh boy, how do I share this? What are they going to think of me? What if I get dirty looks? What if I get more whispers? She's not doing that. She's running in. And she's been loved by God who is good, even knowing where she was and what she's done. And she runs and she tells everyone, come and see him. He knew who I was. Friends, when we're overwhelmed by the goodness of God, When we're overwhelmed by the fact that he would love a sinner like me, then we wouldn't be consumed by a fear of others. We're not going to be consumed by trying to control the situation. We're going to be consumed by God because we are for something greater than ourselves. We've forgotten ourselves at that moment. We're not focused on ourselves, what society tells us to do, what Facebook tells us to do, or Twitter tells us to do, or Instagram tells us to do. We're focused on God, and all of a sudden, everything else becomes secondary. She's seen a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven, and she's like the guy in Matthew 13, the parable that Jesus says, this guy who finds this treasure that's hidden in a field, and he buys the field, and he, cover, he covers the treasure up, and he buys the field, and he sells everything that he has so he could get this possession. She's so caught up that she will do whatever she can because it changes everything about her. God has met her. She found joy. It doesn't make her life easy now and trouble free now. When we say that God is good so we don't have to look elsewhere, it doesn't mean that we're, because we're caught up in who God is that it's just going to be perfect for us. In fact, if you read the rest of church history, you discover that for those who followed Jesus, that those who found their joy in Jesus, they went through some incredible hardships, incredible pains, incredible sadness. But this joy in Christ was the anchor that kept them no matter what they went through. God's goodness toward them, the gospel, God's love toward them, who God was for them was their anchor. 
And even when the waves hit, because they hit, this gospel sustained them. See, the reality is when we find this joy as she did, there is something in us that finds rest. There's something in us that has been searching for that rest. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. There's been, there are times when I think that we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering, in our hearts of hearts, have we desired anything else? Wondered if we desired anything else but heaven. We're longing for joy and satisfaction, but friends, we're searching for it in all the wrong places. And God, like he did at the woman at the well, says, I'm here. Know who I am for you. See, God is infinitely more interested in our joy in him because, as John Piper says, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in God. My time's up, but let me give you four quick things from this lesson. Number one, searching elsewhere will always disappoint and hurt. Searching elsewhere will always disappoint and hurt. This woman searched everywhere else. We know searching elsewhere will disappoint us. Number two, lesser joys must be confronted and repented of. Jesus confronted her with it. What she was searching for, what she was going after, these lesser joys must be confronted and repented of. You cannot find joy and satisfaction in money or family and then look for joy and satisfaction in Jesus as well. They cannot compete with each other. You must confront the idols that you have served to find joy and satisfaction in. And you repent. You turn away from them as your ultimate joy and satisfaction. But here's the crazy thing. When you find ultimate joy and satisfaction in God, when you're asking who God is for you and you really understand it like the Samaritan woman, she was amazed that the Messiah was talking to her. Some of us aren't amazed that the Messiah is talking to us. You're like, it makes sense. I mean, I've been a Christian all my whole life. I lived a good life. Why wouldn't the Messiah talk to me? Look at what I've done. If that's you, you're never going to find joy and satisfaction. But you, when you have found joy and satisfaction in the forgiveness and grace of God and who God is, when you see him as good, when you get to be known by him and you get to know him, then all those other joys, you know, you can hold them with an open hand. God, my family, it's from you. My possessions, it's from you. My job, you gave me this job. My money, you gave me this job. And in that moment, you can actually enjoy them because you're not clenching on to them, holding on to them, afraid of losing them. You actually enjoy them as gifts from God, but you must confront, repent of your worship of these idols, your bank account worship, whatever your well is that you find joy and satisfaction is. Number three, God meets us where we are. Some of you guys are going, okay, I got it. You're right, Sam, I want to see this. I knew I wanted to hear this, but you need to go clean. I need to go clean my life up first. I need to fix some things about me first. I got some stuff I need to figure out. This woman that morning had no idea the life-altering conversation she was going to have. She's going at noon to avoid people, and Jesus starts talking to her, and she goes, here we go again, but God meets us where we are. Friends, this morning, you're here so that God could meet you here. Don't push it off. Number four, our hearts are made for joy and delight in God and God alone. Our hearts are made for joy and delight in God. We will find our identity in what we find most worthy. So can I ask you, as we're about to come to this table that celebrates the fact that Jesus died for my sins, can I ask you, do you see God as most worthy? Do you see God as loving you, as being kind towards you, is wanting you to know him deeply? What you find most worthy is what you are going to find your identity in and what you're going to seek towards finds satisfaction and joy in. Let me close here by saying one last thing and we're done. We talk about mission a lot here. We talk about living on mission for Jesus. We talk about going and telling people about Jesus. Last week, we talked about the fear of other people. This woman had every reason to fear other people. People gossiped about her. People whispered about her. She avoided everyone at all costs. 
But when you're consumed by who God is, can I tell you this mission becomes automatic? Look at her. It says, the town saw her saying, hey, he told me everything. I saw her and he was like, my life has changed. And the town was like, if the Messiah is talking to her, then maybe we should go check him out as well. And the scripture says the whole town came out to see Jesus. This woman that previously avoided everyone, the glares, the looks, the suspicions, she has been changed by the Messiah, meeting him. Friends, you will be satisfied, and she was satisfied in knowing Jesus, and she becomes the greatest missionary to Samaria. The entire village came. See, most of us, including myself, when it comes to evangelism, we're like, I just need to suck it up and go tell someone about Jesus, and then maybe I'll enjoy God because... I'm being obedient to Jesus. But friends, when you get consumed with enjoying God, when you are overwhelmed by who he is, telling people about how good he is should come natural. It should overflow out of your love and enjoyment for Jesus. It will happen as we worship God in our daily mundane lives. People will go, hey, you do your job so well when it really doesn't matter. Why do you do it so well? Why are you here on time and why do you work so hard? Why do you do this differently? Why do you behave differently? Why do you do what you do? And then at that moment, we could say, because I'm serving God. I'm living for the approval of the one whose approval matters. Because God has saved me. Because God has given me joy. God is not against my joy. God is for my joy. And friends, that changes.